Some teams suck. There's no avoiding it. And when you're in charge of one of those teams, you need to have a plan for how you're going to work around those limitations. Today I'll take a look at the tactic used in my Sampdoria save, where we eschewed expectations of a relegation battle by finishing 8th and narrowly missing out on European football. This is not a plug and play tactic. Instead I'll be focusing on how we orchestrated our counterattacks by analysing our opposition, so you too can apply this approach to your own teams. So what is a counterattack? According to the FA's football learning site, a counterattack is a direct and fast attack that occurs from a moment of transition. Consisting of minimal passes, the aim is to create a goal-scoring opportunity before the opposition can recover their defensive shape. Whilst we'll take a look at defensive structure a little later in the video, let's talk for now about outlets. Outlets are the means by which you will make those transitions, options that allow you to move quickly from the defensive phase into the attacking phase. In the example here, Blue have just won back the ball, and there are now a number of options available. If the success of a counter-attack is measured by how few passes it takes to create a chance, then a threat in behind is the ultimate outlet. Through elite movement, mismatch in pace, or ideally both, this is a very direct way of transitioning between phases. As a result, it is also a very quick way to surrender possession, and without the right players can just put you immediately back under pressure. Another option is to play into space for a player to hold up the ball, while others join in support. In the example here, we play it into the channels, but could be played centrally to someone who excels with their back to goal. This is often a safer route than before, allowing your defence to get some respite, but relies on supporting players getting forward quickly. We can achieve something similar by carrying from deeper positions also. Often a turnover in possession means there is space to exploit, and having someone who can drive directly at the opposition can cause an already out of shape defence to collapse further. Finally, there is the link up player, someone who excels at flick ons or knockdowns to help find the third man. In truth, this is not really an outlet itself, but an intermediary route to find someone who can perform one of the previously mentioned activities. Whilst the example shows a knock on to get a player in behind, this could just as easily be used to free up someone who would carry the ball from deeper. A good counter-attacking tactic will have multiple outlets, allowing you to create opportunities in a variety of situations. Many have only one, while some, arguably, have none. You also need to know your opposition. What will be effective against one team may not be against another. We'll take a look at how I adapted my approach against Roma and Juventus in a short moment but first we need to see how the Sampdoria squad shapes up and what it means for our planning. Using the outlets discussed earlier, I've identified which players can fulfil those roles. Ideally, we would have players who could perform multiple functions, but this squad is lacking in quality, and there is actually a secret fifth column for players who can't really do anything. And you can see how this informed our transfer policy. Out went Gabbiadini, Caputo, Leris and Ver. In came a traditional target man in Philip Tietz, wingers Valentin Mahaila and Enrico Baldini, and a young utility player in Aldo Florenzi. So let's take a look at the base tactic, which is perhaps surprisingly a rather milquetoast affair. A 4-3-3 which, when in periods of sustained possession, ensures occupation of the five horizontal corridors. For more information on that, check the previous video that should be appearing in the top right corner. Our focus here is on our defensive structure. A low block and standard defensive line allows us to be compact, whilst trapping outside keeps us narrow. We've reduced our pressing frequency to help ensure we maintain our shape as much as possible. We will concede chances, but our job is to try and make sure those chances are of a low quality. The most surprising aspect here is that I do not have counter selected. Whilst we will look to counter attack, I don't want us going all Benny Hill and rushing forward without care. Instead, through a positive mentality and higher tempo, we'll encourage quick movement and let the players counter when the conditions are favourable. Similarly, player instructions are minimal too. With the increased risk from a positive mentality, we have scaled that back on the fullbacks and Carrillero, whilst the more defensive midfielders are encouraged to engage in tackles. Ultimately, everything is kept simple, as this is merely the base from which we plan for each game. Once one game is finished, we reset to this point and start making tweaks for the upcoming fixture. 
which leads us nicely into the Roma game. Our starting point is the next opposition report in the Data Hub, which in the Just Skin is also available from the Tactics screen. From here we can get a basic feel for how they play, and there are a few things that stand out. Firstly, the narrow 3-4-3 means they have numerical advantage in central areas, but their wing-backs can be easily isolated. Their right-hand side is weaker than their left, both in terms of average match rating and also my personal opinion of the individual players. And finally, whilst they're not necessarily a bad tackling outfit, it is one area where they are performing below average. This is all relative, mind you. This is still a Roma side that currently sit third in the table and have scored the fourth most goals. The first step of our game plan is going to be to funnel play into wide areas by showing everyone onto their outside foot. We're not going to trigger any additional pressing, so the plan is to essentially cut out passing lanes and force play into the wingbacks. With an aerially dominant back three and two screening defensive midfielders, relying on De Luca as an outlet would be akin to Watford's attitude towards managers. Sure, it might work sometimes, but it's definitely luck more than judgement. Instead, we'll deploy him as a poacher so he can occupy defenders in the box whilst we focus our attentions elsewhere. Our best options here are likely to be the space vacated by Karsdorp and Rinaldum. We will put Mihailo on attack duty and instruct Florenzi to dribble more. Pass into space and run at defence will be added to encourage these situations. With the additional attacking duties, Duracic will move down to support and will instruct him to stay wider to take advantage of space behind Spinner Zola. This might seem a weird game to highlight, as our goal came from the second phase of a corner and we didn't win the match. But what we did see during the game was the effectiveness of our game plan. A lot of joy came from the left flank, with us repeatedly getting in behind only to be let down by poor finishing. Our attacking central midfielder was able to break forward on many occasions. Furthermore, we restricted Roma to low quality chances, with their only goal and subsequently almost all of their XG coming from a freak error that ultimately had nothing to do with tactical shortcomings. Our next game is against Juventus, now managed by Xavi. This is going to be a very different challenge to the Roma match. They are below us in the league, there is no question that their squad is considerably more talented and we expect them to dominate possession. The first observation is their left hand side is more attacking. Whilst they might not be deployed as playmakers, Pogba and Moretti are very creative, whilst Kostic is a much more attacking wing back than Danilo. This is also a team that likes to dribble, which is perhaps no surprise with Chiesa in the team. Like with Roma, our starting point is to try and keep the ball away from danger. This time, that means funneling play away from Pogba and Moretti and out to Juventus' right. Chiesa is very much a threat though, and so we'll drop Mihaila deeper and instruct him to man-mark. I do expect there to be space behind McKenney and Kostic, and so we'll be instructing Florenzi once again to dribble more, whilst we'll move Tietz onto Getty in the hope that he can flick the ball on for Sabiri to get in behind. We'll also look to prevent short goalkeeper distribution, to try and force Juventus to go long instead of building up from deep. Many things happened as we expected. Juventus dominated possession and should have scored. We did a great job at keeping the ball away from the left-hand side for the most part, but when they did get free, they created chances. Thankfully for us, they all fell to Weston McKenney. There was one surprise. Gatti did not start, but still our plan to focus on Sabiri as our attacking outlet was fruitful, with all our major chances involving him, either as the final shot or feeding Tietz, the latter combination providing the winner. The results speak for themselves. An 8th place finish might not seem that impressive, but this is a bad team. In 15 simulations for my League Tactical Identities video, they were relegated all but once. By focusing on maintaining our defensive shape, we finished with the third best defensive record in the league, and only lost 8 games. An expected consequence of this approach is that we will be performing a lot of defensive actions, and so it is no surprise that we performed above average in all defensive categories, and that the majority of those actions occurred in our defensive third. The biggest indicator of our success, however, is that Ordero had the highest expected save percentage. This can be a confusing stat to many, but what this essentially shows is that for shots on target only, the average chance was 0.12 xg. If we included all shots in that calculation, 
it would be down to 0.09 xG per chance. Where we fell short was in winning games. 13 draws, 9 against teams below us in the table, showed that we weren't as effective in games where we were expected to take the initiative. This was especially true in the first half of the season, where we were scoring less than a goal per game. This improved after the January signing of Philip Tietz, which gave us a reliable outlet up front and improved our goal output to 1.41 goals per game. Ultimately, a good counter-attacking system is built upon providing a solid defensive structure, and then understanding how you can expose the weaknesses of your opposition in transition. What worked for Sampdoria against Roma is unlikely to work for Burnley against Man City. Nonetheless, there are some key points to keep in mind. Know your shape. A compact defence makes it hard for the opposition to play through, but if your players don't suit the formation, holes will appear. It's all good and well having Neymar as a winger, but he's not going to do the work required to maintain your defensive shape. Know your outlets. Identify how players can contribute as outlets and make sure you have multiple options. If you have only one outlet, your opportunities to counter will be limited. Know your opposition. Every team poses a different threat and you need to react accordingly. Restrict key players and focus on exposing areas where they overcommit. I hope this will serve as useful knowledge and give you the tools for building your own counter-attacking system. Let me know in the comments how you get on or tell me about your greatest achievements as underdogs. Links to the face pack and skin used in this video are available in the description. And if you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing for more FM content. Until next time.